The Audi five-cylinder engine is one of the best sounding engines of all time. It's an important part of what gives the Audi Quattro its legendary status that it has earned today, and it's why we're sticking with an Audi five-cylinder for our Audi Quattro project. Now for the new viewers around here, I sourced an 82 Quattro for our next channel build. The problem being, it came with a blown engine. So I sourced this. It's a 2.2 liter AAN engine sourced from an S4. It's the perfect platform for making power, and I'm hopeful that at some point down the road, we'll put down about 500 to all four wheels. But before this engine goes into our Quattro, it's gonna need a rebuild because, well, it looks like it came from the bottom of the ocean. Thankfully, to help with this rebuild is Lightbow, which just so happened to be in the very same building my shop is in. But that's no coincidence because the shop owners Byron Wilcox and Khalil Kassem happen to be some of my best friends. In fact, those of you that have been watching the channel for long enough will definitely recognize Khalil from some of our E36 episodes when we were tackling the rear suspension. The OG Stanceworks fans out there will know Byron Wilcox as the other name that adorns the top of Rusty Slammington. Obviously, these are two of the only guys I trust to work on anything of mine, and the Audi is no different. In their shop right now, they've got some pretty cool projects, like six-speed converting and standalone swapping this original Dynan twin-turbo V12 E32, and they're building a featherweight wide-body E36 race car. Of course, the core of their business is maintaining and modifying European cars, so building a hot Audi motor for our project will help to show the world what my friends and their new business can do. On top of that, I want to be involved in the process and to take you guys along for the ride, and thankfully, they don't mind having me in the way. So, we're going to get out the tools, you kick back, let's disassemble an Audi 5-cylinder. The first thing we're removing from the engine is the original wiring harness. There's nothing wrong with it, but considering we're going to go for a standalone system, I'd like to redo it so that everything is clean and tidy, so this will go into a bin and I'll sell it once I know we don't need anything off of it. With hopes of tearing the engine down completely by the end of the day, Khalil turned his attention to the exhaust side of the engine. It took removing only a single bolt to make it completely clear that the rust was going to make disassembly a serious challenge. So while Khalil worked on that, Byron began removing the front end accessories. Byron wasn't having any better luck on the front end either. In fact, not only did he have to use penetrating oil, he had to break out the map gas torch just a few bolts in. Although I bought this engine from Atlanta, it's pretty clear it came from the northeast. With progress crawling along, I hopped in as well. Even areas of the engine that I expected to be clean, such as the bosses for the fuel injectors, were disgusting. I have neither records for this engine nor any idea how well it was maintained, so discoveries like this don't bode well for what we might find once we get this thing pulled apart. On the other hand, it is clear that at least some maintenance has been done to this engine. The timing belt wasn't totally rotted away, and based on what I know after taking this engine apart, a timing belt job isn't a walk in the park. However, I'm also assuming that it must be possible to change the belt with the crank pulley in place because this thing did not want to come off. Penetrating oil isn't effective immediately, but on the other hand, heat is, and we are hopeful that some map gas would help loosen the threads of this bolt up. However, after looking at the factory shop manual for this engine, it's clear that it's tightened down to 330 pound-feet of torque. That combined with the rust means this bolt is gonna be stuck. So while the penetrating oil worked its magic, I moved on to removing the coil pack cover, only to discover that this thing is admittedly kind of weird. The coil packs are bolted to the cover itself instead of nested into the valve cover, and each one is hardwired into a specific loom. It looks like to replace these things, you'd have to splice them in. We moved on to removing the intake manifold, which had one set of easily accessed bolts and another set of bolts that were rather tough to get to. We turned the engine over for a bit better access, but still, I spent way more time than I want to admit trying to get to those hex head bolts, only to find out a little bit later that Audi was smart and put pass-throughs in the intake manifold to reach them. 
I'm not sure if this falls into great design or terrible, or maybe both at the same time. I'm pretty sure to run this engine in the Audi Quattro, which is considered a small chassis car, we'll need a different manifold, so if you guys have any suggestions, leave them in the comments. With more or less everything removed from the intake side of the engine, we turned our attention to the alternator. As you can see, the last bolt that holds it on is the most stubborn bolt so far. The impact hammer obliterated the end of the bolt without sliding it out of place. Most of the hardware on this Audi engine has socket cap heads, including this one, which is fully stripped out. So facing this conundrum, we turned to the only solution we could conjure up. There's no doubt that this isn't the right way to do this, but we're convinced it's the only way. Even the torch wasn't doing any good. However, with the alternator cut free, we finally have access to the bolts that hide underneath it. And with those, we can finally remove the alternator bracket and get this engine one step closer to fully disassembled. We finally have our first good look at the block of this thing, and as said, it looks downright awful. It's gonna take an immense amount of work to clean this thing up and keep it from looking like a boat anchor. From here, Byron turned his attention to the oil pan. With it removed, we can more easily hold the crankshaft in order to remove that crank pulley bolt. And obviously, it'll make it possible to remove the rotating assembly itself. Applying enough torque to remove that crank pulley bolt does require a bit of redneck ingenuity. The boys stuck a jack on the engine stand itself and then used a 2x4 to support it because all of us have seen an engine stand fail. But with the added support, Byron gave it everything he's got and with a bit of luck, he actually managed to break this thing loose. Perhaps equally as surprising was how easily the hub pulley came off. It didn't require a puller or any special tools. It just slid right off. Now, obviously we did get to take a look at the rotating assembly in the block, but with the valve cover off, it was our first chance to see the health of the valve train, which surprisingly looked perfect. Everything inside of the engine has been stark in contrast to what the outside of it looks like. Thankfully, the head design of the AAN means we can pull the cylinder head off in one piece. We don't have to remove the valve train from it in situ. Instead, meaning we can do it on the workbench. From here, Byron worked to remove the cam caps, the cams, and the lifters, instead opting to leave the valves and the valve springs in place for the head machine shop. It's likely that I'll go with 7A cams in this motor, but I haven't decided if I'll modify the valve train further beyond that. There's the possibility of things like oversized valves or aftermarket titanium retainers, upgraded springs, and so on, but I'm not really sure we're gonna need any of them given our relatively tame horsepower goal. It's all stuff that I can decide once I talk to some friends that are more knowledgeable than I am. Back over on the block, there's only a few more things that we need to remove from the block itself before we can pull the rotating assembly out. First, there's the water pump, and then the oil pump and front main seal. Thankfully, for once, both of these came off without a hitch. Without a fight, all five pistons came out and they all looked to be in great shape. Although there was one surprising discovery. 
and that's that all of the piston rings had the gaps lined up, which is a huge no-no, and I have no idea how this engine made any compression. The thrust on the crankshaft felt good, and it rotated well. The bearings looked great once we removed it, and after giving the crankshaft a once-over, it too looked to be in perfect health, although I will be sending this thing out for a once-over before it goes back in the engine. We'll want upgraded rods for sure, and I've got to make a decision on the pistons. As said, the block is in awful shape, at least on the outside, but looking at the cylinder walls, all of the original cross hatching is still fully visible and looks perfect. Realistically, it looks like we're just gonna have to put in some elbow grease to get this thing to look the part, but I think we've got a great engine to start with. All right, guys, there you have it. The engine is disassembled. The parts are ready to go to the machine shop. I just have to decide what parts and pieces I want to put inside the engine, such as rods, upgrading the valve train, cams, things like that. Got some decision making to do, but I'm super excited about this. We're making good progress. Now, as far as the Ferrari goes, I know a lot of you guys are waiting for an episode, and I am too. I really want to put one together. I've made some progress. The engine is ready to go back in, but as you can see, there is a trailer in the middle of my shop at the moment. It fit in here by about a quarter inch above the door. I mean, it's insanely close. Problem is, I can't take it back outside right now because they have torn up the parking lot. They are repaving it. And so the trailer is stuck inside. If the trailer is stuck inside, I can't get the Ferrari on the lift to put the engine back in it. There's an E30 in front of it, which I have to explain. Uh, that's a parts car. If you remember the white E30 coupe that I bought, I don't know, maybe eight months ago, nine months ago, we're gonna dive into that really soon. We've got lots of stuff going on in here, but I can't put anything together right now. I can't do anything here in the shop. That's why we were next door. So what am I gonna do right now? I don't know. I might be stuck just waiting around for the rest of the week. If I get lucky, I'll have an episode at the end of the week. If not, I'll catch you guys next week. Either way, thank you as always for the support. I'll see you guys soon.